Welcome to our Lenten Reflection Series and welcome to this very nice House of God here in the parish of Arda, County Limerick, Ireland. We are here in this lovely church of the parish that is a very unique parish, extraordinary for the history that it has. For many reasons, not least amongst these is the world-famous Arda Chalice which dates back as far as 8th century Ireland. My name is Father John Mochler, priest here in Limerick Diocese. I'm a consecrated member of the Institute, the Secular Institute. In Italian it's called I Servi della Sofferenza, which in English means the servants of suffering. It was requested by Padre Pio and began when the Blessed Virgin, in one of her apparitions to Padre Pio, told him to ask a young priest who was there with him at the time, he'd only been ordained for one year, Father Pierino Galeone, to found this institute, which would be made up of two branches, priests who would take the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, like Padre Pio, to live and promote his spirituality throughout the world. And the other branch, consecrated lay members who do the same. They take the three vows, but they remain in whatever professions they work in, and in that way evangelize from within the workplace. This Sunday we begin our reflections on the readings for the first Sunday of Lent. And I begin by speaking on how Jesus, just before he began his public ministry, was baptized by his cousin John the Baptist. Then he goes out into the desert for 40 days. Uh, this was the beginning of his public ministry. And at the end of that ministry, we have it in John's Gospel, when he celebrated the Last Supper, he said, I have left you an example that I, as I have done for you, you should do. Now, very often, people take that to be just literally meaning the washing of the feet of the disciples. But I believe that we should see in this, he was referring to everything that he did from the very beginning of his ministry. That as he has done, we ought to do. So now, looking at today's gospel, what has he just done that he's asking us to follow his example? He went out into the desert, led by the Spirit of God, which inspired and influenced everything that he did. In our turn, we are now called to follow Jesus and unite with him in the desert for 40 days. We are preparing for the Easter ceremonies, and this is why we try to make the most of these 40 days of preparation. When I say join Jesus in the desert, I mean we begin penitential practices. We start self-denial. We do what Jesus has asked. We take up the cross and we follow him because that is what the 40 days of Lent are about. Concentrating on the cross, following Jesus in a particular way. I, I said we are doing it in preparation for a worthy celebration of the Easter ceremonies. But that's not the only motive. Uh, if we look at what happened on Ash Wednesday, we, we, we get the first big reminder that it's not just about preparation for the Easter ceremonies. In the long term, it's preparing for the end of our lives. On Ash Wednesday, we had heard these words as the ashes were put on us. From dust you came, 
and to dust you will return. Now, obviously, that applies to the physical body because God took us from the dust, breathed his life into this body made of dust, and in the end, it's the physical body that goes back into the dust. But we, we are not just the physical body that is visible to the human eye. We, there is a spiritual dimension to our being. That is because God created us body and soul. We are a spiritual and immortal soul. In other words, our future is for all eternity because our soul was not made from dust. It does not go back into the dust. It is because of the spiritual and immortal soul that we will live forever. So here is the important question that each of us now beginning Lent should ask ourselves. What type of future are we going to have? What's it going to be like? Well, that all depends on what our lives, according to how we have lived them, presents at the moment of judgment. If we look at the reading for tomorrow, Monday, first week of Lent, first day of Lent, the good Lord is giving us a good reminder of this so that we keep in mind, apart from preparing for the Easter celebrations, we are preparing for the final judgment. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all his angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed by my father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you since the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food, I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. One of these times that Jesus was really hungry and really thirsty was when he went out into the desert, fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. The gospel that we just listened to for today points this out immediately. During that time, he ate nothing, and in the end, he was hungry. Now, what happened at that moment? He was tempted. The enemy of God, enemy of mankind, tried to take advantage of the situation knowing that Jesus was very hungry, very thirsty, and he tried to tempt him to give up. But let's ask ourselves, what was the greatest hunger and thirst that Jesus had? His greatest hunger and thirst was for our hearts, for our souls, in purity. He wants us whole and entire, and this is what the battle is about. God wants us for the life of heavenly glory, joy, happiness, everything that he has good in store for us, so good that the human mind cannot comprehend it. No human eye has seen anything like how good it is. Then there is the enemy who was in that heavenly state and lost it and has not forgotten what it's like. So, out of envy, he wants to stop all of us getting there. So he battles. And here is where we are called 
to defeat and concentrate on these 40 days in a particular way. Concentrate on all the ways we can increase within us the love of God so that we defeat the enemy. And by the way, he's not a myth. This is one of the ways that people try to content themselves today because this evil being is so horrific and so evil and such a powerful force that people don't want to hear about it. Numerous priests and bishops throughout the world are even afraid to speak of him. Uh, not to mind, highlight his tactics and inform people how he operates so that having the knowledge, we could avoid the dangers. We cannot be silent. Yes, we don't like talking about him. But because he's a real being, we have to. Uh, Pope Francis, <clears throat> in Gaudete et Exultate, has highlighted that we're not dealing with a myth or just an idea. He says, it is precisely the conviction that this malign power is present in our midst that enables us to understand how evil at times can have such a destructive force. Hence, we should not think of the devil as a myth, a representation, a symbol, or a figure of speech, or just an idea. This would be to make a grave error, a big mistake, because it would cause us to let down our guard, to grow careless, and to end up being very vulnerable. Why does the church give us these 40 days? Not to be weak and vulnerable, but to grow strong. There's no need for fear and no room for fear. Why? Because Jesus has won the battle. Jesus went out, took him on, and defeated him. So the secret to success is to join Jesus in the desert and unite with him. Today's gospel makes it very clear that we are dealing with a real being. Our faith demands that we believe the word of God, that we welcome it and that we live it. We, in other words, this gospel teaches us we are called to do battle against the enemy. Make the effort to defeat him out of every area of our lives. And that is why the church gives us this time of grace, this uh, time of Lent. We will only defeat the enemy, not on our own, but with God's grace. And this is what we have to see Lent as these 40 days. God giving us this time of extraordinary grace, giving it to us through the church, his mystical body, so that we grow strong and that we give it our all. So here now is where we have to decide and say, yes, I'm going to join Jesus. I'm going to take seriously these penitential practices. I don't like self-denial because I'm used to my comforts, but I'm going to practice the self-denial because Jesus did it for me. He did it for my loved ones. He did it for everybody. So I'm going to unite with Jesus. My yes will be a big yes and not yes today and in a week's time when I'm beginning to feel the, the pinches of the, the carrying the cross, I'll decide no. It cannot be yes and no. It has to be a total yes as the models we take, Jesus and Mary, her whole life was yes. And if we do that, we grow strong. Otherwise, we decide, as I've often heard, well, I don't want to be over the top. I wouldn't really take it that seriously. 
Oh, I'll write to do a small bit. I might give up an ice cream. Adults saying this, that's what you hear from a child. I w- I'll give up a bar of chocolate each day. Oh, now, if that's our attitude, we stay at home sitting on the couch. What does the catechism call this? Where we don't take Lent too seriously. We don't make a real genuine effort to progress in holiness. It calls it sloth, spiritual sloth. And this does not root out any evil out of our lives. It does not open us up to receive God's grace in abundance, which he's pouring out in these 40 days. This is what the Catechism calls spiritual sloth. And after the break, I'm going to speak on what the Catechism says on this. It's very challenging, so we need to hear it. very welcome back again to our part two. I'm Father John Mochler speaking to you from the beautiful parish church here of Arda, County Limerick, Ireland. If you joined us in part one, you will know that I've been speaking to you on the importance of following Jesus during these 40 days of Lent in the desert to defeat the enemy. I highlighted how he uses temptation to stop us just as he did with Jesus. And spiritual sloth is the danger we have to be wary of here. I refer to the Catechism, which says it's a culpable lack of physical or spiritual effort. We find this in 1866 and 2094 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It is one of the seven capital sins which represent the I don't care or I'm not really interested attitude. And that is the wrong approach to these 40 days. Because with spiritual sloth, a person sees the practice of virtue as being difficult So the natural reaction then is to resist the service of God. The person becomes slothful, or another way to refer to it is as spiritual laziness. The soul grows sluggish, and the thought of the journey forward becomes painful, burdensome. The idea of right living inspires not joy, but disgust because of the effort that is required to grow in virtue. Jesus is asking us during these 40 days to make a sincere effort to grow in virtue, experience the joy and the happiness that comes from holy living. So spiritual sloth, in this sense, is not just a specific vice, according to the teachings of St. Thomas Aquinas, but it is rather a circumstance of vices, all of which cause the person to violate the commandments of God. And here is where we need to take Lent seriously, to grow strong in virtue, so that living the Ten Commandments of God is a joy for us, because this is what God wants us to have, a taste of the joy that lies ahead of us in the future, which can be experienced in this life. We see it in the experts who have gone before us, the saints, the martyrs, even when they were being martyred. They had that deep peace, that deep joy, which comes from true fidelity to Christ, living the Ten Commandments, 
And in that way, God gives us a taste of the joy that lay ahead of us. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Here, the good Lord is telling us, we have to take these 40 days seriously. There is no room for spiritual sloth. We join Jesus in the desert with all our strength, all our might, showing that we live the first commandment out of love. So let's decide a big yes. Now, in practical terms, what is joining Jesus in the desert? What does it mean? How do we do it? It begins with practicing self-denial. So it is denial of the pleasure of the eyes, pleasure of the ears, pleasure of every sense. When Jesus went out into the desert, and it says, the gospel today from Luke says, he fasted 40 days and 40 nights. That meant he fasted too from sleep. Just think for a minute. What do you associate with the desert? First of all, it's a place of silence, absolute silence. It's solitude to the extreme. You're away from every distraction of the world. There is no commodities. You don't have anything to do only in that place of silence, concentrate on God. Now, where is the most isolated place of solitude that we can go to and avail of in the most extraordinary way during these 40 days. The sacrament of confession. Because in the confessional box, if we are genuine about the sacrament and make a sincere effort to prepare for the sacrament, we expose our soul to God. Forget about the priest, he's only the instrument, but it's God you're talking to, who reads the soul. He already knows what's in it, but nobody else knows what's going on in there. You may as well have met Jesus in the desert. It's total solitude. You expose your soul and Jesus responds by doing what he told St. Faustina, the Polish mystic. In the confession, I perform the greatest miracle. I return the soul of the person to the spotless state of their baptismal day. How does he do that? When you confess the sins with true contrition, he removes the sins by pouring in his sanctifying grace. And with that outpouring of graces from God, or inpouring, I should say, into our soul, comes the strength to resist the temptations of the devil, the illumination of mind to pray better, the strength of will to put into practice the good that the Holy Spirit reveals to our intellect. Uh, actually, I, I, I could not summarize here in the couple of minutes we've left the immense benefits that come from a good confession. And 40 days of Lent is the extraordinary time to do it, even if we have been away for a, long, a lifetime. Uh, take the time to prepare. That's most important. Because for the sins to be forgiven, there has to be contrition of heart. It's not a case of just run from the shopping centre, the confession will finish in five minutes, I'll get there before he finishes, and pop in and say the sins. Pope Francis spoke about this. It's not dry cleaners where you run in and just dump off the clothes. There has to be contrition. 
that's a grace that God grants. But he will grant it if we have made the, the worthy preparation. We are disposed to our fasting, prayer, night vigils, adoration. These are the penitential practices. This is joining Jesus in the desert. And I'd like to finish emphasizing fasting from food and drink. Because in a week, two, three weeks' time, you'll find it hard. Remember this. While you're fasting, you're denying yourself food and water, food and drink, just having the bare necessities that you need to stay alive. You are feasting magnificently, spiritually. This is the most fruitful and fragrant, pleasing offering to God. But at the same time, that fasting combined with prayer and almsgiving is the most lethal concoction for the enemy. It destroys his whole plans and we remain with the special protection of God. Thank you for joining us today here in Arda. Uh, we look forward to you joining us again next week when we will speak on the transfiguration where Jesus reveals the heavenly glory and the beauty of the soul. So don't miss it, because it will be a great inspiration for us to continue. <laughs>